Hello, hello, hello. Cheers, Kevin here, and welcome back to some more Kerbal Space Program. Perhaps the final episode of this little mini series, although we may come back for some more stuff at a later point in time. Um, but we'll be taking a, l a little bit of time off of, of this. Um, and uh, before we get going on our way to the moon, taking this stock craft uh, using a KOS core just slapped on there, uh, before we go ahead and uh, land on the moon in, in a single script, uh, I want to walk through this quick demonstration. So I have this arrow that is pointed directly up using uh, Vectraw, which we get from KOS. And uh, I can move it around by hitting some action groups. Um, and what, the reason that we're doing this is that ideally when we're coming down on the moon, we'd be falling down on something flat. But uh, nothing is ever flat. What we would prefer to make sure that we do is leverage our stability assist or our ability to steer uh, to uh, and our reaction wheels to uh, point us kind of opposite to the ground so that if we come down on a little bit of a slope we're not fighting with that slope by trying to point directly upward and inadvertently losing control of our craft so if I move this out here and I'll zoom us out a little bit you can see that this arrow starts to tip over a little bit. And that means that, hey, we don't want to be pointing straight up. We want to be pointing roughly in that direction. And of course, because we actually have structures to play with here, we can get much more drastic examples if we start nudging this thing around. Um, so that'll that'll give us, hey, let's uh, try to point upward in this direction, which, who knows, maybe that'll work. So the way that we do this, real quick, just conceptually, um, is by using some vector math. So we take a point, uh, we, we say, all right, so this is the center point, and I want to know kind of what's called the surface normal, um, the vector pointing straight away from this surface. What I'll do is I'll take a sample, say here and here and here, and make a little triangle. Then if I draw a vector from here to here and from here to here, I can take the cross product of that to get this normal vector. And that's, that's all there is to that. Now, I've added a little bit of extra logic to put in these offsets and whatnot, um, but this will help us just remain a little extra stable once we come in for our final landing on the moon. So let's jump over to the code. We'll uh, tidy that up and add a couple of uh, time warp statements as well, just to make sure that our script runs as fast as possible. And uh, then we can head off to the moon. Alrighty, so I have our code, all of our code commented out, and I've just kind of plopped this uh, right in the top here. I have this function, ground slope, that takes an X offset and a Y offset, which I'm allowing myself to adjust. Um, before we get into the body of this, I'll show you kind of the main uh, thing. We say, okay, local X is zero, local Y is zero, ground slope X and Y, and then whenever I hit an action group, I'll increment X or decrement X and call ground slope again. And then I just wait until false to make sure that this uh, program never ends. Uh, we can go ahead and get rid of that now. Okay, so the first thing that we're doing in this function, well, we take the X offset and Y offset parameters. And uh, first thing we do is we get east. Um, so we, we want a, a directions that we can actually pull out from the center of our the position that we want to know about so we can generate that triangle. And uh, to get that, I'm just going to take the cross product of the north vector and the up vector. So we get these two vectors, and I can get east from that. Could be that I have this backwards, but it doesn't particularly matter. We just want something that's perpendicular. So what vector cross product is, is going to do is if you imagine um, our up vector, um, so you, you stick your thumb in a thumbs up position, north vector, say stick your pinky out straight in front of you, well, the result of doing a cross product of those two vectors is going to be a uh, vector that is perpendicular to both of those. So that's, that's what we're getting. Then we take our, our center position. Um, and this is normally the ship position, but we're allowing ourselves to manipulate that by tweaking that uh, X and Y offset. Although in this case, well, we don't need that anymore. So I can just say local ship is, uh, local center is ship position. We'll remove that because we don't need to do these modifications anymore. In fact, we can remove these parameters too since we're not messing around with all of that. So then we're going to take A, B, and C being the points of our triangle. And I'm just going to say, hey, give me the geo position for this vector, but with some modifications. I'm gonna say, take the center, which uh, yeah, is the ship's position, add uh, five north vectors to it. And the reason I'm using five is because triangles and three, four, and five, and blah, blah, blah. Um, it, it doesn't particularly matter if our triangle uh, is, is perfect, but whatever. Um, B is same thing, except we're subtracting three norths and four easts. And C is going to get the geoposition of minus three and minus four easts. 
Okay, so that's just gonna get us these geo positions relative to the body. Then I say, okay, give me three vectors based on those geo positions. And what I'm telling it to do is say, hey, give me the altitude position at this terrain height. And all that that does is it's going to give me the point on the surface at that position. So basically just drawing on the ground. So then we have this triangle that is placed on the ground at whatever the terrain height of those points happen to be. And then we say, okay, give me a cross product of those two vectors. And then I'm normalizing it just for fun. Um, and then all this stuff down here is just drawing the vectors. So we can remove that. And we don't need to assign this to a temporary variable anymore. We can just return the value and we should be good. So the only thing left to do, so that basically if we call this, it should give us back uh, the ground slope and we can just lock our steering to that. Um, and if we, yeah, then, then we've got that. So all that we wanna do is modify our do hover slam to say, hey, uh, we're waiting until our shift vertical speed is greater than zero, which is basically when we are done having to break and then we lock steering, lock throttle to zero, and we unlock steering. Now that can be problematic because we're not trying to reinforce the whole stay upright thing. So what we'll do is say lock steering to ground slope. And then we'll wait 30 seconds and then unlock steering. And that should just give us a little bit of uh, additional stability, which should be nice and helpful. All right, so now all we have to do is uh, add some uh, secret sauce. And actually, I, I've already done this. I uh, forgot that I sneakily added these in here. Um, I, well, I've done some of this. One thing that I've done is I've said set map view to true here. Um, and this is a sort of a breaking the fourth wall command because it's not really, map view isn't something to do with the in-universe world. It's something that's gonna make it a little easier to record. We don't have to worry about setting the map view on or off. Um, as soon as we've shut down the final stage of the engine, I say, hey, let's go ahead and set to the set the map to, we'll jump into the map view. And then after we've done our transfer maneuver, uh, let's go ahead and hop back into looking at the ship. So that's something that may be useful in your own scripts if you kind of want to keep an eye on exactly what things are doing. It's not technically part of what our launch is, but that's okay. Um, other stuff that we can do is add some judicious time warping. So um, I wanna jump into execute maneuver. Uh, where is that? Execute maneuver. There we go. So this, uh, we have this whole thing here. Uh, local start time is calculated. Start time, wait until time seconds is greater than start time minus 11. Blah, 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 blah. Um, wait until time seconds is greater than start time minus 11. Right, okay, wait until we're 10 seconds away from, from the start of the maneuver. Um, rather than just waiting, why not warp two? Oops. And warp two is a command that's another one that sort of breaks the fourth wall here. Um, we can simply say warp two some time. So I'm gonna say start time minus 15. Uh, that's yeah, minus 15. And warp two is gonna handle the ramp up and, and ramp down. It's, as, it's the same as if you click along the orbit and you say warp to here um, effectively. So um, that's gonna handle all that. And then we don't have to sit around, once we've figured out a maneuver, we don't have to sp sit around waiting for it to happen. Now it could be that in some cases, um, you know, we it, it tries to warp higher than it should. And so it goes, hey, you can't warp that fast. And then it ends up, uh, you know, breaking out of it, but that's okay. Um, it'll at least give us somewhere to, to start. Um, one thing I do want to also add here, set circ to improve converge blah. Um, when we calculate our circularization maneuver, we're still in the atmosphere when we're doing that. That's in fact part of the reason why um, it can take so long is because when we're comparing um, those slightly different step values, we might get slightly different results because we're still feeling dealing with that uh, atmospheric drag, but whatever. Once we figured out the optimal, optimal maneuver, um, let's go ahead and wait until uh, altitude is greater than 70,000. So we're out of the atmosphere. That way, when we try and do execute maneuver um, and it tries to do its time warp, uh, we should be, we should, don't have to worry about it canceling time warp when we escape the atmosphere. So we'll stay in regular time um, until we get uh, into orbit. Uh, well, until we get uh, out into space and then uh, we'll go ahead and time warp ahead to apoapsis. Okay, other places where we could do this um, is in do transfer. And we have a lot of code here. Do transfer. I suppose this could deal with a little more organization. 
There we go. Okay. Um, we find our start search time. We calculate all of this. Execute maneuver. It's going to warp ahead to that maneuver. And then we have this whole thing where we wait until the body is the moon. Uh, well, we can wait. We can warp two. And we've got that maneuver. Actually, it's interesting that we still have this local maneuver in here because we're not using that anywhere. Um, we can say maneuver, or actually, we don't even need the maneuver. Um, once we've executed it, we can say um, orbit next patch ETA. And that'll give us the time uh, to the next patch, uh, though we will want to add time seconds to that. Um, and then, yeah, we can remove this line because it's not getting used anywhere. Um, and then let's subtract... Uh, say, I don't know, five seconds. So we'll say, go ahead and warp to uh, the time when we're about to shift into um, the sphere of influence of the moon, five seconds before that, then wait until we are on the sphere of influence of the moon, and then wait for one second just in case it bounces back and forth again. I think that's mostly been cleaned up in recent versions, but, you know, just to be safe. So there is one more place where it would be really helpful to have a uh, warp to, and that is... Uh, <laughs> within our within our do hover slam function and that's because uh well basically we're running in real time from the point where we are in the sphere of influence of the moon all the way until we are uh, starting to do our suicide burn and that takes a good 20 minutes something like that in in game time i, I could be pulling that number out from nowhere we have to wait until our percent between the stopping distance and the distance to ground is greater than one and it starts off at, at very minuscule number so so there is syntax we can use to just manually control our warp level. We can say set, set warp uh, to four, and that's going to put us in warp mode, and that's great. Um, but the challenge is uh, we, we can even put this inside regular conditions. So we can say um, until, all right, well, let's see, set warp to four, and then wait until blah, and then say set warp to zero, right? So wait until percent is greater than one and then set warp to zero. But the problem is because we're warping, this percent is going to tick a lot higher and it's possible that we'll miss the point where it crosses that boundary because um, it's increasing more rapidly. So we do want to sort of slow down. It's possible you could come up with some sort of fancy way of monitoring a value and, and rolling back the warp slowly so you don't um, approach it and doing fancy stuff like that. But um, I'm going to pull some numbers um, out of nowhere, basically out of a prior script that I had written to do something like this in the hopes that it ends up being kind of reasonable enough for us. Um, we'll actually put the set warp to zero right up here because uh, we'll use uh, a different starting condition. So I'll say wait until percent is greater than 0 0.1. And then we'll set the warp to three. Then we'll wait until percent is greater than 0 0.4, and then finally we'll set the warp to zero. So this is increasing rapidly, and it's uh, we're basically just being extra safe here. We're starting a setting warp to four, then we're ramping it down once we start to get a little bit close. Um, we'll warp a little bit less aggressively. We wait till it gets even closer. Then we're saying, okay, we'll jump back into real time. We wait until percent is greater than one before we do any of the actual logic, but that should hopefully cut down on some of the additional time that we have to spend watching this craft do its stuff. Now, this is going to be kind of trial and error if you're trying to come up with these warp uh, values and uh, conditions to stop. Um, it's easy if you're relatively easy if you're warping to a time, but if you're warping until something is true, um, I'm going to say warp until this thing is really close to, to true, uh, then you've got to kind of either manually do something like this or you can write some sort of fancy way of tracking how much it's moving per second and slowing down so you don't exceed it or, or stuff like that. But I, I, I'm not sure if that's really feasible in this situation because I think it's an exponential growth type of situation. So with all of that done, I think we have all of the warps and stuff uh, in place. Last thing is uh, to put final launch script in here. Although, of course, I'm going to have egg on my face if we go ahead and try and launch this and discover that I've added some typos. But we will see together in our launch straight to the moon. Ha! Guess who wrote wait until altitude is greater than 700,000 instead of 70,000? Good job, Mr. Me! Alrighty, and we are go for launch. Now, I'm just going to pretty much just talk over this entire thing because, uh, well, I don't have anything to do. Um, I am going to play cameraman a little bit, um, although there are uh, some extensions I understand that uh, you can basically control the camera uh, with some KOS scripts as well, which is something that's very cool and something I'd be 
very excited to play with. Um, now, the, the warp statements, unfortunately, I think the... I won't know that there aren't any bugs at all until we're coming in for final approach, so I'm hoping I don't have to record this multiple times, but we'll see. Um, so we are bringing this sort of mini-series to a close because the idea was to uh, provide a tutorial that was accessible uh, to new people to get a stock craft over to the moon. So that if you just wanted to focus on learning uh, KOS, um, this would be a way to do that. Now, one of the things that we encountered in that process was that, hey, if we're trying to avoid the math, we have to rely on some uh, hill climbing and machine learning algorithms and uh, encountering the, hey, when we change, uh, the, it's, it's one of those places where these are sensitive to initial conditions. When we change the goalpost a little bit to make things easier for us to calculate, well, it changes the, the way that the mechanism works and changes the way that our error function works and made it difficult for things to converge. So we spent a lot of time tweaking. Now, this is unfortunate. I was excited to uh, kind of make something that would come from a more authoritative place, but realized, hey, there is a fair amount of stuff that I did uh, in this, uh, in, in the past series especially, uh, that was plain wrong or didn't wouldn't work under certain circumstances. And uh, thankfully, we encountered some of those circumstances here. Um, the hill climbing algorithm, uh, based on uh, closest approach being one of those, that if we really wanted to create a robust closest approach calculator, would need to find something that is tolerant of multiple peaks and valleys. valleys. Um, so one thing that we're seeing here, and I think this is because we are in the atmosphere, we're at 45, um, we are seeing it oscillate a lot and it's taking longer to converge than it should. And I think the reason for that is simply, uh, well, for one, we didn't have anything preventing it from uh, stepping backwards. Um, we could improve the hill climbing algorithm a little bit by adding something like that. Um, and so when it's looking at, hey, should I fire one meter per second or two meters per second? Um, it's perhaps getting uh, the eccentricities that aren't helpful. Um, it's saying one is better and then the other one is better and blah. Now, it, I was worried the first time I ran this before I realized we had set our weight into 700,000. Um, that it didn't add the maneuver node, but hey, it's waiting until we get above 70,000. And then it should go ahead and add that maneuver node, and we should be able to time warp ahead to it, um, which should be nice and easy for us. So as soon as this gets, there we go, look at that. I didn't have to hit anything. It almost looked like I cut the video or something. Um, we are now, yeah, 15 seconds away. What did we say, wait 20? I, I forget what, what we subtracted from it, but um, our execute maneuver wait for seems to be working just fine. And there we go. We are firing. Getting our periapsis up here. One of the things that I'm uh, excited for, kind of wrapping up this uh, miniseries, is uh, playing with things that are more experimental for me. Um, and along those lines, okay, so now we're moving into the uh, transfer stage. We've already figured out where we wanted to start our search because um, it's it's now shifting in and out. So we, we did ha tell it, hey, go ahead and wait till you're on the far side um, as kind of your starting search point. And it is searching for that lunar encounter. Oh, this is great. Um, no, but uh, excited to play with some more experimental stuff. Um, probably take a little bit of a break from this, but there we go. We were already time warping ahead. Now, of course, not quite as fast as we might like, but that's all right. Um, and uh, in addition to kind of playing with some more KOS stuff, maybe playing with some other series, um, I do want to get my studio area set up because, because since we uh, uh, moved into our first home, well, the acoustics have been dreadful. In fact, I'm I'm recording this um, at a with the computer sitting on a, a a row of cabinets that have, I guess, a little bit of space for legs. It's not ideal, uh, basically. And uh, you may have noticed a slight drop in audio quality as a result. Um, but I'm eager to kind of get my space back in order and and be able to provide um, higher quality stuff. So um, one other thing that I wanted to mention is that we're doing nothing at all to ensure that. Uh, we're finding the most efficient burn here. Um, and, I've, and this is a bit steep of a Delta V requirement um, for us to end up perfect. Also, because we're doing the time warping, it does mean that this lumbering craft that doesn't turn particularly well doesn't have the entire orbit to try and uh, nudge itself closer. Um, so we are firing a little bit off access initially. And there we go, we've staged. Um, I suppose I should pull this open, just in case, in case folks are curious. I could throw up, nah. Uh, where's Kerbal Engineer? There we go. Show Kerbal Engineer. Why not? And there we go. So yeah, this would have been 
we're, we're, I think we're pushing the, the boundaries a little bit of, of what we really needed to do. But um, we have nothing. Yeah, okay. Time warp stopped because we're under acceleration. So that was an area where we could have waited a second after completing the maneuver before trying to do our time warp. That's okay. Um, I'm not going to go back and fix that. But if you wanted to, um, that's when it's trying to do our time warp to the Mooner Encounter. I'll just go ahead and, and warp us manually over there. Of course, if I discover that there's a bug in the code, then I'll go ahead and patch that up. Um, but if you're going ahead and doing this yourself, just note that, yeah, if you try and time warp under acceleration, well, it's not going to be pretty. So 10 minutes away, I'm not going to sit here for 10 minutes. Let's warp to, we'll do kind of successive, uh, successive warping, Zeno's Paradox and all of that. Okay, so one minute, 22 seconds, warp to there. And basically, once we get into the sphere of influence of the moon, then our code that's doing the warp, uh, that's explicitly setting the warp values, um, should kick in. So we've got, yeah, 13 seconds to wait here. And then we should be in a pretty good spot. So I'm excited to see how this does. Um, I appreciate all of you for uh, the help in, in debugging uh, or pointing out uh, errors that I may not have caught. Um, and just for generally the support of the series, it's been definitely very entertaining. Um, and enlightening to realize, hey, there are some areas where I thought I had a valid strategy for doing certain things and eh, turned out not to work so well. Um, I hope for people who are relatively new to KOS that this has still been somewhat useful and even though a little bit of it has been kind of learning out loud. So we are ramping down our time warp and I'm really hoping that we don't overshoot. So, okay, we're down to a time warp of uh, one. So we've set our warp to zero. We're steering in the correct direction, but we haven't fired our engine, which means we haven't crossed that threshold of death. It's very easy if you time warp too fast and uh, are checking conditions to realize that you've crashed into the moon before you even have a chance to uh, do those optimizations. So, uh, or, well, had a chance to drop out of time warp rather uh, because things are moving so fast that if you're saying, hey, I want to uh, set warp at zero when uh, my altitude is blah, well, your altitude may cross that threshold by a significant margin before uh, the KOS core notices. And we are firing. Now, I'm optimistic. This is a lot less cratery <laughs> than uh, uh, landings that I've, I've dealt with before. So we can be really hopeful here that we end up in a good spot. If we look at, let's take a look at surface. So... Um, impact time, 31 seconds. So we should have about... I'm using Flight Engineer as sort of a cheat. We're in the Midlands, which is great. And G-Force, lovely. Time. Do we have any... Let's see. Is there anything helpful here? Nah. Okay. And once this is down, we should be all good to go. Now, remember, we did also, uh, previous uh, previous examples of this, we landed sort of somewhat on edges of craters, and so making sure that we were using our steering to keep us stable was particularly important. It looks like we're going to be coming down on something that's relatively flat, um, although you never know until you really get down there just how flat flat happens to be. And this stopping distance formula really works like a charm question is there we go okay we see our shadow and are we gonna slow down in time it's always scary watching suicide burns but let's see and look at that a perfect ish landing now it is <laughs> it is fighting I think I think what happened that little jostle right there was that because of the way that we were sampling the terrain we assumed that the slope right underneath us was a little bit more severe um, than it actually was. But look at that. We have gone from a single script to the moon. And of course, we have to plant a flag. Um, now, I believe there's no sort of... I got to turn on RCS. Don't I? There we go. Uh, oh, I forget the controls for this. Man, I can't do manual things. All right. Quit ragdolling. Okay. Can you turn, please? Whatever. Okay, let's uh, let's go there. Go ahead and uh, let's 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 keep KOS up up here for the for the lovely photo. But uh, we'll go ahead and plant a flag. And we will call this uh, until next time. Cheers.